Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, graphs, because they're a very useful um, concept in, uh, in understanding computer science, useful way of modeling problems. Um, and they're also um, pretty central to a lot of things in Rosetta. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I want to just say what they are and some of the things that you can do with them uh, so that you can um, get used to seeing them and thinking about problems maybe as graphs or problems on graphs. OK, so, um, so where do we use uh, Rosetta? Oh, I'm sorry, graphs in Rosetta? And the answer is everywhere. Um, you can think about graphs in terms of um, chemical con uh, excuse me, the chemical composition of the structure that you're modeling. Um, so there's like this chemical connectivity graph. What atoms are bonded to other atoms? Um, and then how far apart are two atoms in this graph? How many bonds separate them? Um, we use graphs in representing the kinematics of our structures. So there's the fold tree and the atom tree. And the word tree here is referring to this graph theoretic property, right? Um, so graphs are central to both of those. Um, in scoring, we have um, various data structures that we use in order to um, uh, help the process of scoring. Um, these include the energy graph, which I don't think you've yet seen, um, and then uh, the, the context graphs, which are used by some of the energy functions to, say, record the number of C-beta neighbors within a certain distance. Um, in packing, uh, oh, sorry, um, skipping ahead. So in the scoring terms, we have um, this sheet term, which um, I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this talk, uh, which looks at, um, for in ab initio structure prediction, it asks how large is the set of, um, is the sheet that I'm, I'm looking at in this structure, is it one or two strands, is it three strands, is it more than, more than that? Um, and, and it assigns a score based on that. And, then, and you can understand the sheet score in terms of a, a graph property. Um, and then this, uh, this H-patch score, which was uh, developed by Rania Zak, um, also uses an, another similar graph property uh, um, that, that we'll talk a little bit about. But we want to talk about the H-patch score in particular. Um, in packing, um, we, we have an interaction graph. And we'll talk about that on Friday in the afternoon um, in greater detail. Um, in neighbor detection, there's this um, point graph, which is used to figure out uh, what, what, resi oh, sorry, what residues are near each other. Um, and then the, the structure is represented as, uh, sorry, the, the graph has as, um, coordinates, points in space, and that's why it's called the point graph. Um, in minimization, we use a minimization graph. It's this other data structure for holding uh, the kinds of stuff that you need um, to have available during minimization specifically. Um, and that's used in, in minimizing the entire structure or in, um, in RTMin and um, the min packer. Uh, in when you're representing, uh, I'm sorry, when you're just minimizing, say, a few side chains um, at a time. If you want to understand the structure of our libraries, you have to understand this dependency graph. Um, and here's, here's a picture of some of the, the inter-module dependencies. Um, this is a, a picture from Protocols 1. This is too small to read. But um, uh, each of the, the arrows in here represents a dependency between portions of, of uh, or I'm sorry, subdirectories uh, in, in the protocols directory. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the library structure in this, in this presentation. Um, and if you want to understand why it takes so long to recompile Rosetta, um, then you have to uh, get to understand what the, the pound inclusion graph is. But I won't be talking about that today. OK, so um, formally, uh, a graph is a set of two things, uh, V and E, where V is a set of vertices. And E is a set of pairs of vertices called edges. Um, and so uh, informally, you can think about this as vertices are things, and edges are the relationship or the existence of the relationship between those things. So here's a very simple graph um, where the, the set of vertices is U, V, and W, um, represented by these little circles here. And then the edge set is the pair U, V, and the pair V, W. And if you were to draw that, you would, you would end up with this little uh, structure right here, or this would be one way to, to draw this graph. Um, graphs are, are useful to computer scientists because they're um, powerful ways uh, to model problems. Um, and so an interesting problem might be, let's say you're, you're making a map and you want to um, draw the border of every state um, in the US with a different color, um, but so that uh, no two neighboring states um, have the same color border. Right. You don't want like uh, two um, orange borders uh, right next to each other. Um, so how would you figure out what's the fewest number of colors that you could use? And certainly you could do it in 50 colors, 
but that's not a very interesting answer. Um, right? So one way you can do it is to say, OK, each state here is a vertex. And then, uh, and I'm, I'm going to leave out the northeast because this is just too crowded. Um, <laughs> OK, so um, uh, and then uh, if two states are, are um, bordering, then that's going to be my set of edges in this graph. Right? Um, and so now uh, what you have is this, uh, is this graph where um, only certain pairs of, of vertices are bordering. And you can, you can model this now as a, a question of uh, if, if you assign each um, vertex a color, then uh, what are the fewest numbers of colors so that no uh, two vertices that have an edge between them have the same color? Um, and uh, there are proofs that I'm not going to go into saying that if you have a, a planar graph, then you can do it in four colors. Um, but I'm going to leave that uh, for you to find out on your own. OK, so um, another way of looking at graphs is being uh, as useful things is um, I, I come with a, a little bit of a, a philosophy background. And so um, in uh, uh, predicate logic, you have um, these statements where you have uh, objects like u and v. And then you have uh, predicates on them like f. And so you would say like uh, the state of the system might be such that um, f would be true for u and v. Or f of u and v is, is a true statement. Um, and f and v and w is a true statement, but maybe not that um, uh, f of u and w. Um, and you could represent that similarly as a graph. And you, and you can think generally like if you have some property like um, uh, let's say you had a whole bunch of people and you wanted to talk about whether they were related to each other. You could have uh, uh, edges between people who were like, say, from, uh, or, or let's say um, A gives birth to B, then you would have an edge in that graph. And then you could see like, how far apart are two nodes in this graph um, is whether or not they're related. So if I have a sister, um, then we'd be separated by uh, two edges. Right? And you could say, OK, but at two edges, we're related. So, uh, so if you have some predicate like gives birth to, then you could um, turn that into a graph relationship. We typically call these family trees. Uh, OK, so um, I'm going to talk about some common graphs. So trees are a very common graph um, and common yeah, form of graph. Uh, there's a couple different ways, a couple different equivalent ways uh, to talk about whether a graph is a, is a tree or not. So one of them is that, um, uh, say, you have uh, the number of, of vertices minus 1 is equal to the number of edges. That is, there's one more vertex than there are edges. Then and, and if the graph is connected, then that gives you a tree. Um, if there's um, one and only one path between any two nodes, so if I, if I want to go from this node to, say, that node, um, and I try to walk there, then I would have to follow this path. If, um, uh, if there's only one path between any two nodes, I guess I should also say that it doesn't repeat vertices, because if you want to go that way and then back and then down, uh, that would be a separate path. But let's say there are no repeat vertices. Um, then if there's only one path between any two nodes, and, and that means every two nodes, then you're a tree. Um, uh, similarly, if, if you have one fewer uh, vertices than, than, I'm sorry, one more vert vertices, vertex, than there are edges, um, and there are no cycles in the graph, then, then you have a tree. Um, and uh, similarly, if, if the graph is connected and there are no cycles, um, then that's a tree. Okay, so these are different ways of talking about the same thing. Um, in Rosetta, we... Um, Let's see. So uh, this is an example of a tree. It, it looks vaguely tree-like. Um, but you can see that there, there are no cycles in it, um, and that there's a way to get from, every, from one vertex to every other vertex. Um, yeah, Abba? Well, this doesn't seem like a very good idea for uh, uh, modeling residues in Rosetta, because a lot of residues have rings in them. Right, so the atom tree. Uh, Right, needs like so. For instance, phenylalanine can't be easily represented in an atom tree. Right. You have to cut one of the yeah. chemical bonds, and that's why. Um, let's see. So phenylalanine, unfortunately, most of the places, not all, but a, a large percentage of the places where there are cycles, you don't have to worry about uh, flexibility. So if you, um, for phenylalanine, if you just go around the ring and then stop before connecting again, mm -hmm. um, that'll that'll preserve the planarity of the ring. Um, and still let you keep a tree. So is there a bond between the labs? There is a bond. 
So the fold tree uh, and the atom tree, those are um, representations of the kinematics of the system, but they're not good descriptions of the chemical structure of the system. Yeah. So, uh, so you can't just rely on the atom tree to know whether or not um, two residues are bonded to each other. Um, if you were representing cyclic peptides, for instance, then you, you wouldn't be able to, to represent that with a tree, right? If you wanted to connect uh, residue one and residue n. Because um, then you yeah. often give disulfide bonds and things. So. Yeah, that would also, that also uh, adds um, like a, a cycle to the, to the chemical composition graph. Um, Will you talk about how those things are graphs? Um, no. So maybe I can tell you a little bit about them now, which is that um, the, uh, in places where the kinematics of the system don't enforce uh, ideality of the chemical structure, um, we have to change the scoring function so that the scoring function will help preserve that, um, that ideality or the constraints of the system, right? So, um, for instance, proline is an easy one to point to uh, because there is a little bit of uh, uh, conformational flexibility for proline, right? Um, so we actually have a term in Rosetta to make sure that the proline ring closes, right? So it's the pro-close term. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, if you wanted to have, so um, just you brought up disulfides. There's another place where we have specific terms for the disulfide energy function. So you add restraints to the system to keep the... They're, they're scoring terms. Um, yeah, and they're, and they're effectively restraints. But um, they don't they don't go through the the constraint machinery, which is a, a different thing. Right, yeah, yeah. They're not constraint free states. Yeah. Um, right. But um, we do a lot of things in internal coordinates, like we'll say set phi to like negative fifty or something, right? And that'll propagate uh, conformational change down through a kinematic tree, um, and uh, everything except that phi, all the internal degrees of freedom, will remain fixed. Um, so you don't have to worry about the um, the chemical uh, constraints getting changed if you're just setting phi. Um, unless there's a cycle in um, the chemical conductivity graph. If you have like a disulfide and ch setting phi like now breaks that disulfide, um, then you have to have a scoring term to say, hey, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. All right, so, um, uh, right, and so, um, right, so the, the atom tree and the fold tree are, are like for the sake of kinematics, but not for the sake of scoring. So those who are they're conceptually separated. Yeah. Okay. So um, right. So um, maybe also useful is a forest is a um, is a graph where each connected component is a tree. Um, so you could imagine uh, um, if you were to say remove this edge from this graph, then you'd have this part that was a tree, and then the other part that's a tree. And it's the whole graph isn't a tree, but uh, because it would no longer be connected, but each connected um, bit, each connected component, is a tree. Okay, so what's a connected component? Um, so it's a subset of nodes in the graph, uh, such, so, so the, call this subset S, uh, where um, for every pair of vertices U and V, um, you would have a path that, that would connect you from one to the other. Um, and so one interesting problem that that you find lots is uh, given a graph to identify the connected components in the system. Um, and uh, there's, say, a number of different um, possible algorithms, but I'm going to talk about two of them because they're, they're pretty interesting and they're actually relevant to um, some of the terms in Rosetta. Um, so one of the w ways you might consider it is um, in terms of uh, computing the transitive closure um, of this graph. Um, and another would be um, using this union find algorithm. Okay, so. Um, Let's say we want to solve this problem. Um, uh, so um, you can imagine, um, uh, so what does the solution, so the first question is, what does the answer look like? Um, so one way would be to say, uh, you have like an n by n table where um, uh, row i and column j represent whether or not vertex i and vertex j are in the same connected component. If it's, if it's one, then they're in the same connected component. If it's zero, then they're in different connected components. That could be like one way of representing the answer to this problem. Another way would be say, um, uh, give me, like I'll, I'll give you a function, and this function um, will take pair i and j and return true if they're in the same connected component. Maybe there's um, some bit of, of data that they're using to, to figure out that. 
um, but it's not taking up n by n space. All right, so what are the two, what are the, um, the different ways that you could pop? Yeah? So uh, could I just to visualize that matrix? Would the diagonal be, the diagonal element would be One. itself, right? Yeah. So would you consider that connected or not? Uh, is vertex i in the same connected component with itself? The same connected component, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it would be. Diagonal. So the diagonal would be one in that case. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So um, so how do you represent a graph? Um, one way to do it would be with an n by n table, where you just uh, put ones uh, in all the positions where um, row i and column j, column j um, are connected, or node i and uh, node j are connected by an edge in this graph, right? And that that would be stored in one in that position. Um, but you could do um, any number of other things. Um, so you could have like uh, uh, just a one integer representing n, the, the number of nodes in the graph, and a, a list of integer pairs representing edges. That would be a possible representation for the graph. If there are not very many edges, then maybe that's a very efficient way to store uh, the, the graph. A slightly more complicated version of that is where you had, say, some class that represents a node, and like you'd have one instance of that class for every node in your graph, and then some other class that represents um, an edge, uh, and then one instance of the edge class for every edge in your graph. And then you would have like a list of pointers um, for each node to the edges that were incident upon it. And then pointers in the edge back to the nodes that they're incident upon, or maybe just some index for them. Okay, so let's just talk about the matrix representation. So let's say that this is my graph. I've got five vertices in it, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then uh, I've got edges between one and three, three and four, and then two and five. And so if I were to talk about like a matrix representation where I have a one for every position where there's an edge, it would look like this. And so um, three would ne be next to one, and four would be next to two, four would be next to two, five would be next to two, sorry. Um, I'm counting base zero here. Um, and then, uh, uh, so one question is like, how do we solve this connected component problem? And one way, one way we could do it is by trying to walk along edges and mark um, as we go where we're able to get. Um, so you can imagine the first version of this is like um, M1. That's like I can reach J, node J from node I in one step, <coughs> walking across one edge. And M2 would be um, if I can reach J from node I in two edges. And then um, M sub N would be whether I can walk to I in N steps. Um, so what would an algorithm like that look like? So can I compute these? M1s, M sub 2, M sub 3. Um, so one way you could do that is, uh, so you'd iterate across all i and across all j. And then you ask, um, is it reachable from i? Set this to false. And then you look for all other nodes, k. And you ask, can I get, um, uh, so my current, um, current matrix is m, and my next matrix is m prime. Um, and so I say, can I get to k uh, from i, and then from uh, k to j, or let's see, so what do I mean here? So, um, uh, right, so this would be uh, the original graph, the original set of adjacencies. So is there an edge between i and k? And this is um, where I was at the last iteration through this loop. Um, or say, uh, I'm trying to figure out um, um, m prime is what I computed at my previous iteration, which is where I got to um, taking um, i minus one, or let's say uh, l minus one steps, and I'm considering the lth number of steps now. All right, so j would be reachable from i in this in this case, right? And I could store that fact in this um, this uh, this extra uh, matrix um, that represents how far I can go in l steps. And so with that, I could I could um, figure out that say uh, in if this is my original uh, matrix m, and this would be um, uh, where I can get in in two steps, so this is, this is one step. And then um, from, uh, from one, I can get to three. And then from three, I can get to four, and I also can get back to one. So in two steps, I can get to, to one and to four, from, starting from one. And similarly, from, from two, I can get to five and then back to two again. Yeah? Uh, Matt, shouldn't there be a one in the lower, uh, two, five? Here? Uh, in the first or matrix? Here? No, in the, in the first matrix. All the way, yeah, in the fifth. Yeah, but then it's... It's not duplicated there. 
Yeah. Yep. It should be a one. Right? It should be a one. Yeah. It's supposed to be symmetric. It's supposed to be symmetric. Okay, so um, then if you had, like, say, um, all of the possible, all these matrices, um, M sub 1, M sub 2, up to M sub n, and then you just kind of, like, took the or of them. If I can reach um, from i to j in any number of steps, then I say that I'm in the same connected component. That would be, like, a final answer to this problem. So there's another way uh, that we use commonly in Rosetta, which is this union find algorithm, um, and where um, each node represents... Uh, this question of whether I'm in, or, I'm sorry, uh, give me a representative from my group. So, um, you know, like, I'm with that guy kind of thing. Um, uh, so uh, you could start this out where you don't know um, who, in, who else is in your group, but you know that you're in your group. So this, this representative table would be like, um, for each of these nodes, it would be one, two, three, four, five. I am my own representative. Um, and then you're going to iterate across each edge in the graph. Um, in this case, there are three edges in this graph. And you say, um, uh, find, which is, who is my representative? Um, if my representative is not the same as your representative, then we've got to make it so we have each other's representatives. We've got to say we're in the same group. Um, so you can just say uh, arbitrarily, um, my re use representative should also become V's representative. Um, and that would, that would um, put them in the same group. And you would perform a... a so that, that means you take a union of the nodes on U and V. All right, so what, what do these functions find and union look like? Well, so, um, so you have this array of representatives, and you have this integer i. And so you ask for, for i, who's my representative? If my representative is myself, then um, that's the representative of my group. Um, otherwise, uh, um, find out who my representative is by looking at my representative and asking who their representative is. Uh, and uh, uh, and then go ahead and, and return that. But while you've got it, go ahead and ch update my representative so that it's the representative of my previous representative. Have I said representative enough? Um, and uh, okay, so that that would um, that's like a reasonable description of the of the find algorithm. Um, uh, similarly, if the union uh, of two nodes would be say um, arbitrarily take. Uh, uh, J and assigned it the representative of, of I. Um, oops, it should have been find here. So how does that work? Let's, let's iterate across the nodes in this graph. So uh, first node um, is going to be 1 and 3. Or, I'm sorry, first edge is going to be 1 and 3. And so I'm going to um, uh, ask uh, who, is the, who is the representative for node 1 and who is the representative for node 3. Uh, and it's going to be a different representative for each of them. Node 1 says, I'm my own representative. Node 3 says I'm my own representative. Right? And then I'll call union to say, OK, node 3, you're going to say that node 1 is now your representative. Um, if the next edge is, is the pair 2, 5, then uh, similarly, you're going to update 5 so that its representative is now 2. And if uh, uh, the next edge is, is the last one, 3 and 4, then uh, what happens is that uh, 3 says my representative is 1. And uh, right, so this is going to recurse. It's going to say um, three says I'm not my own representative. So uh, find out who the representative is of my representative. And one says so. This will iterate to um, find for representative one, and the answer is going to be one because one is its own representative. And then it's going to pop out and say um, so. This u will be three and v will be four. So find of u is going to return one, and find of Four is going to return four, and so um, four will be updated. And now you have this uh, this array where um, each each position represents a single node, and the, the representatives are such that um, uh, the the set one, three, and four they all say uh, they have the same representative, and two and five they say they also say that they have the same representative. And so this is a way to figure out, say, given any two pairs. Uh, so um, if I asked one and two, are you in the same connected component? The answer would be no, because they have different representatives. Um, so this comes up um, in a number of places, but I, I hinted before that it was in the, the sheet score algorithm. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, in, in ab initio, as you're um, doing fragment insertion, you use this low resolution energy function uh, where you've got a um, uh, low, re low resolution representation of the protein structure, and you um, 
uh, insert fragments into it. And then for each fragment you insert, you score the new structure, and you ask whether the, the structure has improved in energy or, or gotten worse, and use the Metropolis criterion to decide whether or not to accept that fragment substitution. And, and part of the score function here is to look at the size of the beta sheets that you've formed. And the size is determined by the number of strands. So locally you can figure out what each strand is, like you know, each residue um, you can figure out uh, for a stretch, I'm sorry, for a stretch of residues, you can figure out if they're, in the si they're all in the same strand by looking at their phi and psi. Do they have beta strand phi psi? Um, and so if, if they're in a, a long contiguous stretch, um, you say, okay, all these residues are in the same strand, but that doesn't tell you uh, how the strands form into sheets. But you can also figure out if two residues are forming like a canonical uh, uh, beta strand kind of interaction. And so you'd say that those residues are forming a strand pair. So you could figure out um, which strands uh, are paired in a, in a beta sheet. Um, and so uh, if you can figure out, uh, so, so make a graph here um, where uh, you treat each, um, each strand as a node in the graph and each strand pairing as an edge in the graph. And then the question is, what are the sizes of the connected components of this graph? And if I iterate across the sizes, then I can, I can turn that into uh, a strand score. And so if I have just one, street, one strand hanging off by itself, and that gets a high score, that's penalized. But if I bring a whole bunch of, of single strands together um, into, into a larger structure, then that would give me a much lower score, and that would be preferred. Um, and for this, we use the, the union find algorithm. OK, so, um, so trees are fun. Um, uh, and I talked a little bit about connected components. Um, so uh, cycles are another um, common thing that you'll often find in graphs. Um, and uh, we talked about them briefly in terms of um, the uh, chemical connectivity graph, where phenylalanine obviously has a cycle where you can go from C gamma back to itself without touching any node twice. Um, uh, but so, so in general, um, you, can, you can formalize this idea of a path where you start at one vertex and you end up another vertex. And any um, uh, cycle is a path that starts at a single node and ends up back at itself. So if you started at E in this graph, then you could walk to F, you could walk to G and H, and then back to E again. And that forms a cycle. And so this graph is not a tree. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so a separate topic is the idea of, of directed graphs, where um, you're able to represent, say, an asymmetric um, represent, uh, sorry, an asymmetric uh, relationship between no two nodes. So, for instance, the is born by, or I'm sorry, gives birth to, uh, is an asymmetric um, uh, property in a graph. So, um, like uh, you could imagine, uh, well, I won't go into any more crazy family ideas here, but um, so. Uh, uh, so usually, in order to represent a, a directed graph, um, you're just drawing edges with arrows, where you say like it's kind of the arrow is leaving from this node and it arrives at that node. Um, in a in a directed graph, um, you can you can restrict yourself to the set of paths that um, traverse only in one direction. So if you wanted to walk um, uh, from this node and see where you could get, then you'd say maybe be prohibited from going back upwards but you could say get to this node or that node. Um, okay, so um, uh, in directed graphs, you, you could talk about cycles um, as being where you uh, traverse nodes in only one direction, but you still can get back to yourself. Um, uh, but in uh, indirected graphs, you wouldn't consider this kind of graph to be a cycle because you couldn't leave from this node and get back to itself without crossing an edge in the wrong direction. And so this is... Um, a directed acyclic graph, or a DAG, um, and DAGs come up come up um, quite frequently. Uh, um, yeah. So, um, uh, and, and yeah. So directed acyclic graphs, directed graphs that do not contain cycles. That's what the acyclic is all about. Um, our libraries, for instance, um, are represented as as DAGs. Um, that you can't have um, one of the lower level libraries. Um, if it's dependent on, say, a higher level library, then that higher level library can't be dependent on it also. Um, that actually breaks compilation. Um, so it's something to, to really watch out for. Um, and so often when I'm talking about like the, um, the dependency relationship in Rosetta, um, sorry, uh, 
uh, it's this DAG idea that I have in mind. I'll get to that in, in a few slides. Okay, so there are actually really lots of useful algorithms um, involving uh, DAGs. Um, and just one that um, came up almost immediately for me here was um, as I was um, uh, preparing uh, dinner a few nights ago, um, right, I needed to uh, figure out um, what I should do in what order. So uh, I have all these tasks. I need to, so I'm making spaghetti. Um, I need to chop some onions. I need to heat up the pan to saute the, um, uh, uh, you know, saute the onions in, in the hot pan. I have to add some spices. And then, um, uh, you know, before I can, uh, you know, add the pasta sauce, I also need to chop the sausage and get the, um, the sausage in the pan. Um, meanwhile, I've got to prepare the spaghetti. And so the question is, um, what path, uh, so, you know, these are the, the, the directed edges here represent um, dependencies, like I can't saute the onions until the pan is hot or until the onions have been chopped, right? And so there's a dependency between these two relationships. And each one of these steps takes a certain amount of time, right? And so one of the questions would be like, you know, how, how long until dinner? Um, and, you know, given that I'm going to start now and I'm going to be incredibly efficient, how long until dinner? And then um, uh, if I choose the wrong, like, you know, I can only do one thing at a time or um, some things require my attention. What's, uh, what's something that I could uh, not work on for a little while and not make dinner later, right? And so this is, um, this is known as critical path analysis. Um, and it's usually um, used for um, complicated tasks as opposed to dinner. But um, it's a little easier to illustrate on one slide uh, for dinner. Um, so each task takes time. You have a set. Um, and, um, you know, you can't start some tasks until the others are finished. Uh, so what's the task that I have to start on first? What tasks, if they fall behind schedule, would delay the whole project? Um, and uh, um, yeah, so if I know, for instance, the critical path, um, so in this case, uh, I need to have the pan hot uh, so I can begin the 30 minute saute of the onion pretty quickly um, before adding spices and reducing the sauce. Um, so the first thing I need to do is, is put the pan on the stove, and then I start chopping the onions immediately, and that takes me a while get the onions going, then I start the sausage, um, and then uh, I can sa saute the sausage. Anyways, so this is, this is how I figured out how to make d get dinner on the table as fast as possible. Um, and it's, it's well represented in DAGs, and there, there's some, um, well, there are lots of algorithms for DAGs, um, but uh, critical path analysis is, is pretty fun. Yeah? Is there an efficient algorithm for that problem? Yes, do you yeah. Do you use the term something? No. Um, I, I should have looked this up beforehand. Um, so Viterbi, uh, for those who aren't aware, is, is this um, uh, algorithm for inferring the transition properties in um, uh, hidden Markov models, um, and, or the uh, transition probabilities. I don't know what I just said. Um, and um, in this case, uh, we don't have some sort of hidden state that, that would be analogous or a training set to, to work through. But um, uh, yeah, I, I believe you start, and, and it's, it's kind of like, um, I'm trying to remember, because uh, I should know this. Um, but I believe the algorithm is to um, do a, um, you do a post-order traversal of the graph so that you end up, so you go through all of these guys, and then you end up at the end, and you um, work backwards um, for, like, uh, Jack knows off the top of his head, I'm sure. You want to save me here? <laughs> Um, is it Max Fuhrman Kant? I don't, I don't think it is because there's no, there's no edge like um, capacity. Um, but um, or would, would that be honest? Okay, so um, I, th I think it's it's either a, a breadth first search or a depth first search where you're going to sort of recurse through the graph and then um, after you get back, then you kind of work your way. There, there's some way in which you you kind of go back. It's it's cool, and I don't know this. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not like it's for shortest path. Um, for the shortest path? Right. So, uh, you could certainly find, well, let's see. So, um, usually in shortest path algorithms, you have uh, edges that have, like, edge weights or something. Like, how long does it take to get from Detroit to Boston or something? Um, but uh, in this case, it's the nodes that have, like, the time commitment to them. Um,
whether it's the longest path you can get while keeping everything connected with you or is sort of your spiritual path. Uh-huh. Right, so in this case, if you started pulling, I think boiling the, the water and um, cooking the spaghetti would be the first thing to get cut, right? Because it's, it's a short path. And so you'd have to, um, so you'd cut this and then you'd, you'd pull and try to figure out um, back here, I guess, what's going to take the most time since this is a straight line from there. But yeah, it, it is a cool algorithm and it's efficient. And I highly recommend you look it up. Um, and, and to Google for it, critical path should get you to that algorithm pretty quickly. Don't do it now. Um, okay, so, uh, so more on DAGs. So this is um, uh, uh, a description, sort of roughly in, in graph form, of the dependencies of all of our libraries um, in Rosetta. Um, so at the top, we have some very generic libraries, like um, so we have some uh, array classes in the objects FCL library. We have a utility library that has a bunch of um, uh, container classes and, and generic algorithms. Um, we have some numeric library that deals with um, coordinates and... Uh, um, uh, geometric properties, dihedral angles, you can, you can ask some subroutines in here to compute for you. Basic holds some of the, ro like the very simple Rosetta-specific code. Everything above this is sort of not Rosetta-specific. Core is um, where we introduce the pose and score function and the residue type. Um, in the protocols, we have mover and the job distributor and, and the very complicated things like ab initio or the topology broker. Um, and... Um, and so I give these, um, uh, I've, I've put these in quotes because these libraries actually have been split um, into smaller libraries that have, so this is, a, this is a path structure here, right? In this, like there's just a straight line between devel to objects FCL. Um, and this is also a path structure, but protocols becomes quite a bit more hairy. Um, but the dependency relationship is similar in that like um, you have uh, edges pointing upwards, but not downwards and not laterally. Um, and so, uh, Right. Uh, for instance, uh, protocols 4D depends on protocols 3, um, but it doesn't depend on protocols 4E or uh, 5E or something. 5D can depend on 4D, but not the other way around. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, um, if we introduce cycles in the um, library dependencies, then we would end up um, breaking the build, not on all systems, but on enough where we really care about this. And so occasionally you'll commit code, um, and you'll get an email saying that you've broken the library levels build, and that means that you've introduced a cycle in the library dependency graph. Um, we'll be using this, this picture, I guess, of the, the libraries throughout the week to talk about um, specific uh, modules within Rosetta. Okay, so um, uh, what do I mean by uh, library dependency? In particular, that means um, pound inclusion. So um, utility pound includes some things from objects FCL, and protocols pounds includes files from core. Um, uh, so let's take an example here. Let's say you have, you have some new score term uh, that needs to read data out of the enzyme design class that lives in the protocols library. So where should this new scoring term live and uh, where can it live? So there are three choices here. Why don't you think for just a little, sec, uh, just a little bit if, uh, if it could live in core, excuse me, protocols or devel. Everybody got their answers? Could it live in core? Why couldn't it live in core? As a protocol? It's going to need to read data out of this, this um, uh, enzyme design structure and protocols. Yeah. So, and core can't depend on, on protocols. Could it live in protocols? It could live somewhere in protocols, possibly. Maybe not everywhere. Certainly needs to be in a place where it's allowed to depend on, on this uh, code here. Could it live in Devel? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's totally safe. Okay, let's switch gears for just a little bit. Um, so uh, I introduced earlier this idea that um, there are different representations for graphs. Um, and uh, these different representations come with different... Um, requirements in terms of the amount of memory that they, that they use. And so um, it's worth knowing, say, a difference between two kinds of graphs, those that we call um, sparse graphs, where you think about most edges not sharing, I'm sorry, most nodes not sharing edges between them, and dense graphs where um, most nodes do have edges between them. 
Um, and so if you have uh, n nodes in your graph, then a dense graph um, would require order n squared space, if, if most of them are adjacent to each other. And if you're going to represent, say, the upper triangle of a matrix, then that's going to be n times n minus 1 over 2 um, edges in this graph, or, or something of that size. Um, or, or the amount of memory that it would occupy would, would be this much, um, uh, as opposed to, say, an n by n matrix. Maybe you don't need to have uh, an asymmetry between ij and ji. Um, so you could, you could deal with just the upper triangle of the matrix. This is still quite a lot of memory if n is very large. So um, if you wanted to uh, use a dense matrix to represent the pair interactions in the ribosome, um, then uh, you'd have, say, was it 5,000 residues in the ribosome? So 5,000 by 5,000 matrix gets pretty big quickly. Or that's a very big matrix. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you have, say, n nodes and um, your sparse graph requires uh, uh, order n space, if most uh, nodes are not adjacent to each other, um, let's say you're in some condition where each residue has about 40 neighbors, um, then the, the memory requirement would be, say, uh, 20, to 20 times the number of nodes uh, to represent all the edges. Um, and so in Rosetta, we have a couple different um, sparse graph representations. But let's say... Uh, we're just interested in, in um, guessing what could, uh, what could be represented. So one way would be to say you have this graph um, where uh, you have a list of all the, the indexes of pairs of, of nodes that are adjacent. Um, so what would that, how would that play out? Um, it would be actually fairly difficult if you wanted to look for one node in particular, right? You would have to scan through all of the edges in the graph to see if, you know, if i and j is in that graph. That wouldn't be a very good representation for it. Um, and similarly, uh, it would be um, hard to figure out um, all of the edges that are adjacent on a single node. Again, you'd have to look at, at every node in the graph. And that, that might take up a lot of time, because you're looking at a lot of nodes that aren't, or a lot of edges that aren't adjacent to your node at all. So another way would, to do it would be to say, have each node contain an edge list, or a list of pointers to edge objects. And then um, if you want to, to look for an edge in particular, then you you would go to, so if you're looking for node ij, you would go to node i, and you'd iterate across its small number of nodes, say 40 nodes that you expect on average. And you say, um, do you have a node to j? Right? So if you expect there only to be um, 40 nodes total, then you'd have this um, order one, or this constant time expense um, of, of asking for the nodes. I'm sorry, asking for an edge in particular. Um, if you wanted to, to iterate across all the edges of a single node, then um, that's pretty easy. You go to each node and you iterate across each, its list of edges. Um, and so you could visit all of the edges uh, for a single node, and you'd know all of the neighbors of that node, and you could visit. You, if there were data on that edges, you could get to all of that data as you needed. Um, and, and that you don't have to pay to look at any um, uh, edges that aren't adjacent to your, your node. So if you're like repacking and you don't care about all the pairwise residues repacking um, or something like that, do you use uh, a sparse graph like that? Yeah. As opposed to a dense graph. Yeah, exactly. Is that what Linman IG is doing in terms of the hood or something like that or not? Um, uh, yes and no. So it, it does have a sparse graph representation, but that's not what distinguishes it from uh, the other. There's like a PD interaction graph that oh. you sometimes see if you don't have the LinMemIG flag. And, um, and that's, that's doing something slightly different. Yeah. I'll get to that on Friday. Okay. Yeah. OK, so um, uh, later this afternoon, um, I'm going to have you guys working with, uh, with class graph. So this is a, a base class uh, in Rosetta. Um, so I'm going to introduce a few of the uh, things that we commonly do with class graph. All right, so um, like I said, um, graphs are convenient ways to represent um, things and their relationships. Um, and there are convenient places to put data that would say go along with that relationship. Um, so, uh, so we have these base classes, graph, node, and edge. And um, in uh, the scoring namespace, you have class energy graph that derives publicly from class graph. Class energy node, which derives publicly from graph node. And uh, class energy edge, which derives publicly from uh, graph edge. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, maybe it's not obvious at first, but um, you can inherit from a, a class in a different namespace. And that's totally cool. Namespaces don't prevent you from 
uh, inheriting from things in other namespaces. You just have to say the namespace of the class that you're inheriting from. But that's fine. Um, pictorially, this would look like um, uh, if I draw a, a dotted line around uh, namespace core graph and a dotted line about namespace core scoring. Um, graph uh, is derived from by energy graph when you've got this, this directed edge uh, that shows the relationship between these two. This is a um, UML uh, uh, class diagrams. So energy graph derives from graph, energy node derives from node, and energy edge derives from edge. All right, so what, what gets stored in, in class graph? Uh, or, I'm oh, sorry, uh, let's see, how does class graph operate? So um, there are a couple um, public member functions that I'd like to, to walk through. So down at the bottom of the screen here, I've got the, the private data for this class. So it's got a, a vector of pointers to node objects, and it's got um, an edge list, which is pointers to every edge in the graph. Um, this isn't the only edge list for the graph, but it's one of the edge lists for the graph. And so there's some things you can do. For instance, you can set the number of nodes. Um, so you say, n nodes, I want a, a graph with 50 nodes in it. Um, and if you, uh, the way this graph works, if you had some graph before with, say, 30 nodes and edges between them, it throws away all the edges and all the old nodes and then creates new nodes. Um, you can ask for a particular node, so you get a pointer to it um, uh, if, if you ask for it. You can um, look at a, uh, a particular, or I'm sorry, you can add an edge to the graph. And so this is the common way in which if you want to um, uh, insert a new edge into the graph, this is what you say. You say, graph, put in this new edge between node one and node two. Um, you're supposed to do it in a way so that um, you never put an edge in the graph that doesn't already exist in the graph. In debug mode, it'll make sure that you never do that, but in release mode, um, it doesn't because it takes time to do that. Um, you can delete an edge if you have a pointer to that edge. You say to the, the graph, this is the edge that I want you to get rid of, and the graph will go ahead and do that for you. Um, you shouldn't just call delete on the edge pointer itself. Um, you can ask whether an edge is a member of the graph. Does the, does the edge exist? And you'll give it the indices of the two nodes in the graph. Um, you can uh, ask the graph for the number of edges, um, and it'll return a size. Um, and if you want to iterate across all the nodes in the graph, you can start um, with the graph's edge list, and you can get an edge list iterator, an edge list iter, and start at the beginning and, and iterate to the end. Um, and so uh, there's some amount of code that uh, has a for loop set up so that it's going to get an iterator um, starting at the begin and then increment that iterator until it reaches edge list end. Um, and I'll show you some of that code, uh, I think, in the unit test tutorial later. Um, then you can also ask for um, uh, const iterators. Um, so this gives you access to, to um, non-const edge data, and this gives you access to const edge data. So um, when you dereference this edge list const iterator pointer, or this, this iterator, you dereference the iterator, um, it will give you a const pointer back to the edge, um, meaning that you can't change the edge. Uh, so the, the graph is actually being pretty stingy in, in terms of what it lets you have access to. Um, under the hood, everything is represented as, as these um, uh, non-const pointers, um, but uh, it's not going to let you get um, a non-const pointer uh, that you could possibly modify the, the object to unless um, you have non-const access to the graph in the first place. Class node um, has, uh, oh, it's gone off the screen. Um, actually, not by much. That's just a, the top of a curly bracket here. Um, so uh, each node has a pointer back to its owning graph. Um, it has uh, an edge list representing the set of edges that are incident upon it. This is you know, pointers to edge objects. And then um, it keeps track of the first upper edge that it has. And I'll get to that in just a second. So when you initialize, so the constructor for the node is um, a pointer to its owner and then its index. And the index is going to remain um, constant through the, the lifetime of the node. The node keeps that in its private data that I haven't shown here. Um, but you can ask it for its, its edge list. And you can ask for the, the beginning and uh, the end iterators in its edge list. And you can iterate across all of its nodes. Um, you, can, you can ask uh, if you have constant access to your node for the, um, the const edge list um, iterators, the begin and the end. Um, and because of, uh, well, anyways, um, I won't delve any deeper into that. Um, and then uh, uh, there's this other option of, of asking 
uh, for the lower edges and the uh, or the edges to lower index nodes and then to upper index nodes. And, and the reason that it does this is so that, um, say, in scoring, you want to iterate across each node, and you want to score each residue pair. So you've got a, a graph, and you've got um, nodes in this graph, and you, you go to node i, and you want to iterate across all the edges um, uh, in the total graph, uh, but so that you don't visit any edge twice. And so if you restrict yourself, if you're on i, to only looking at edges to um, uh, neighbors with higher index, then you're never going to hit one edge twice, right? Because if you have i and i plus j as your two nodes, then you'll see it when you're at i, but you won't see it when you're at i plus j. Um, and the way that this is handled is by um, keeping this, this iterator to the first edge in its list to a higher index node. And there's some uh, simple stuff that goes on under the hood, but it makes it it's efficient and it's um, uh, 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 very, oh, excuse me, um, that's um, went way far. Um, it, this makes it um, very easy to, to iterate across uh, edges in, in reasonable ways if you're worried about running time without restricting you um, from not being able to visit all of the neighbors of a node. OK, so um, what does an edge look like? Um, well, in its, in its private data, it's got the indices of the two nodes that it's incident upon. Um, it's got pointers to those two nodes, just in case it doesn't want to like first go to its, uh, if it doesn't want to try to look them up in some other array. Um, and then it's got uh, um, some data, so it, it keeps track of uh, the position it is in in its two owning nodes edge lists, um, and then the position it's in in its owner's edge list. And it's also got a, point to it, a pointer to its, its owner. Um, so when you, uh, I'll, I'll get back to this in just a second. When you construct an, an edge, you give it um, a pointer to its owner, um, a, uh, and, and the graph does this for you. So you usually don't have to, to call, you won't ever call this constructor unless you're deriving a new graph. Um, so the other two arguments are um, the index of node one and the index of node two. Um, and then you can ask it for the index of the first node or the index of the second node. Um, or you can, you can look it up, or, or as protected data members, you can ask for um, uh, node by uh, uh, giving it zero for node uh, the first node and, and one for the second node, because these are sort of C-style arrays down here. Um, so you can get uh, const axis if you have a const pointer, or non-const axis if you have, uh, sorry, this shouldn't be const here. Um, OK, so, um, so why did I tell you about uh, this position in, in node's edge list? Well, that, that allows the edge to delete itself quickly if you're trying to delete edges from the graph. Um, actually, I don't think I'd delve into it any more than just to say that. OK, so um, let's say you do have some problem where what you want to do is store um, relationships between things, and you want to have data um, describing those relationships. Well, the solution is to, is to derive a new class from class graph. Um, so uh, for example, um, the energy graph, excuse me, um, stores residue pair energies on its edges. So when you score a structure, you keep, um, say, the FA attractive and the FA rep score for that residue pair in the energy graph so that if you um, want to get that, that data later, you can access it. Um, uh, the constraint graph is, is similar in that um, it stores constraint energies that have been stored between um, pairs for which the user or you have um, put uh, added constraints to the system. Uh, right, so class graph uh, under the hood is responsible for a lot of things. So it, it's responsible for creating new nodes um, and edges um, and for handling all the graphy things of, of making sure that edge lists are maintained um, and uh, uh, that it's very easy to, to drop an edge, to delete an edge from a graph if you need to. Um, you know, it maintains these edge lists through additions and deletions so that your derived class doesn't need to do that. Um, and so um, the way you would do, uh, so if you wanted to um, uh, create your own graph that's going to um, have data on, on nodes and edges, then you would, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So um, the question might be then, if, if the graph is responsible for, for adding new nodes and new edges, then um, how is that, how is it possible for class graph to make your derived node? Say you've created a new class derived node 
um, or uh, your derived edges. Right? It needs to instantiate the right kind of node. If it, if it instantiates the base class node, it's not going to have the data that you need. Right? And so um, the answer is that there are two. Um, this is called the factory method design pattern. There are two functions in class graph that are um, three functions that are, are virtual um, and that can be overridden by the derived class. Um, so, uh, so they're virtual functions, create new node, and you give it the index of the node. Um, and this uh, will re return a node pointer um, that the graph is then responsible for maintaining. So it'll, it'll free up this node pointer when it's done with it. It's, it's doing this, um, uh, it's responsible for managing its own memory. Um, similarly, if you create a new edge, then um, you would give it the indices of node one and node two, and it would return that edge. Or you can um, say, uh, as I frequently needed to do, I need to copy one graph into another. So I've got an example edge. I've got a pointer to an existing edge, and I want to grab all the data out of that. Um, so these are the these are the three factory methods that are used in class graph. Well, why do you call them factory methods? Um, uh, that's the name assigned um, or given to an, um, in a book called Design Patterns, um, and so. Uh, so we have different kinds of factories in, in Rosetta. We have uh, this design pattern called the factory method. We have the um, uh, abstract factory, uh, like we talked about, um, I guess, in the evening assignment last night. So the mover factory is an abstract factory, and it has the, the registrators and the creators and then um, the classes itself. Um, so that's the name for that design pattern. And then we have other things that we call factories that are not factories, or, but that are just kind of responsible for making stuff. Um, because it's going to uh, uh, create a thing. Okay. Um, it's like like factories do. Um, it's kind of it's also sort of uh, uh, taking a, it's it's factoring the work of um, creating this graph into little portions, um, and so the derived class which knows which so there's going to be this this derived graph that derives from class graph. Um, and derived graph is going to um, know that it needs to make derived node when this virtual function gets called. Okay, and I thought, I thought and why, and why are these functions virtual? I thought usually derived class would be virtual. The class needs to be declared virtual in the base class oh. for the derived class. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, um, right, so there, uh, um, well, let's see, what else is going on here? Um, so. The base, the class graph is actually going to call these functions, and either um, if you've created a, a class graph like the base class, um, then it will it will actually resolve to the base class implementation of this function. But if you created a derived class, like in this example, derived graph, um, then it'll dispatch to the implementations of this function that go with your derived class. Let me see if I have more on the next slide. Okay, so here's. Here's an example of how it works in, um, uh, in the base class. So this is going to call this virtual function, this, this factory method of add edge. And then um, uh, this is that, that factory method. So how does it work? So add edge is, is what the user does when they want to add an edge between node n1 and node n2. Right? So the first thing it does is, is it calls this um, create new edge function. And so an energy graph, which I told you earlier, derives from class graph. Um, it's going to call this function, and it says new energy edge, and it gives a pointer to itself because that's part of the constructor for energy edge, and then the two the note the indices of the two nodes that it's incident upon, um, and then it, it returns that, um, and that's going to be stored in this pointer to the base class edge object E. Um, then, uh, so uh, the graph, like I told you earlier, has this edge list that it maintains, and so it's going to push E back into the the edge list. It's going to increment its counter of the number of edges in the graph, and then it um, tells E, uh, you know, when you want to delete yourself later, you need an iterator to your position in my edge list. So here is uh, that iterator, which is this edge list dot last function, um, and then that that initializes this edge so that later it can be rapidly deleted um, when needed. Um, right. So I haven't told you what what happens sort of. Um, when you create a new edge object or how the edge object initializes itself. But the base class is kind of responsible for setting up the, the node pointers to make sure it's pointing at the, the right nodes that it's incident upon. Okay, so um, uh, I just want to uh, close up here with an algorithm uh, 
that, uh, that's sort of central to um, uh, how Rosetta works in, in rescoring a structure. Um, and it, it's highly dependent on this energy graph. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a fun algorithm. Um, so in rescoring a pose, what, what's happening, say, in ab initio, is that you, um, you have your structure, and then in the middle of your structure, you're going to insert a new fragment. And that's going to um, twist the structure like that. So you, you have this, um, chain, this, this change in the internal degrees of freedom that, that are propagated downwards through the kinematic tree of the system. And so you get new Euclidean coordinates for all of, all of this section of the, of the structure, but this A, this A stays fixed. And internally, um, the, the interaction, let's see, the, the geometries between this residue and that residue haven't changed because the internal degrees of freedom for that stretch haven't changed. Um, and the internal degrees of freedom uh, between this stretch haven't changed. And so those, these sets of interactions here and here and, and there and there um, haven't, don't need to be rescored. Um, and so one of the, um, the tasks is to figure out how to efficiently rescore the things that have changed without rescoring the things that haven't. And so this is that, that algorithm of rescoring a pose. So first is that um, you're going to uh, uh, iterate across all the edges in the energy graph, um, and you're going to ask for each edge um, what is the color assigned to um, uh, each of the residue pairs. And so um, uh, this, this color assignment is like, say, the graph coloring assignment. Um, uh, when I was talking about like uh, borders in the United States, you, you, um, uh, it's, you say color because that's kind of a nice thing to draw if you're working on graphs, but um, it's an integer. So it's, it's just like um, one, two, three, four, five. Um, that's sort of like the groups of residues that haven't moved with respect to each other. So um, in this example, like all these residues would have color one, and then this is where the change occurred. And so all of these residues would have color two. And for the residue that's in the center, um, where there's been internal, or the, maybe the, the, the nine residues, if it was a nine mer, or the three residues, if it was a three mer, they, they've had internal degrees of freedom change. And that gets assigned the special color, color zero, um, uh, meaning that even their internal energies need to be updated. Um, OK, so, um, so you're going to iterate across the edge, and you ask um, uh, for each uh, residue pair, if they have a different color, then drop that edge from the graph. So in this case, the previous confirmation looked like this, and there was, say, maybe an edge between this residue and that residue um, because they were close to each other. And now they have different colors, and so that edge represents an interaction that may no longer be there, and so it needs to be dropped from the graph. OK, then, so, so you know that just by knowing um, what's changed about the structure since the last time it was scored. Um, and that's, that's represented um, in this domain map array um, that's, that's created by the, um, the confirmation object. The atom tree actually figures that out for you, or, or for the confirmation. Confirmation gives it to the pose. The pose gives it to the energies object. Um, and then the energies object uses it to drop edges from the energy graph. I'll talk about that in a little more detail tomorrow. Um, uh, OK, so then, then you have to figure out, um, now that you've got this new confirmation, you've gotten rid of the interactions that you know uh, or, or that um, may not uh, still be there. Um, then uh, uh, you need to figure out which pairs of, of, of residues are now near each other. So in this case, I kind of made it so that everything's now pretty far apart. But you can imagine um, maybe this, in this residue is a little closer to this residue than it was before. Um, and so uh, uh, you, need to, you need to be able to represent that. And for that, um, we use uh, um, this other thing called a point graph. I'm pretty sure you're going to be interacting with this afternoon. So I'm going to take just a second here. Okay, so this, um, this point graph uh, has one, one point, one XYZ coordinate for each of the nodes in the graph, and then you um, use a spatial hashing algorithm to figure out which of the residues are near each other. Um, or if the protein is small enough, you just do the brute force, um, the n-squared computation, if n is very small. And um, yeah, I'm not going to describe the point graph in great detail, but it'll add an edge in this graph um, for every pair of residues within a certain cutoff. And now you're going to iterate across the edges in this point graph. So you have edge ij. And if it connects two residues with different colors, and if the residues i and j are within their um, uh, uh, interaction cutoff, and 
residues I and J may be of different size. So they could be an arginine-arginine pair, in which case they would interact at great distance. Or if they were an alanine-alanine pair, then they'd have to be pretty close in order to interact. Um, so if that's true, if they're of different colors, if neither residue is a virtual residue, then go ahead and add this edge IJ to the graph. And sort of by construction at this point, you know that IJ is not already in the graph. Because if IJ were already in the graph before this stage, then it just got dropped in stage one. And now it's time to actually start scoring. So you iterate across all the ed edges in the energy graph. Um, you score the context-dependent two-body energies. I'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow. Um, you ask if I and J connects two residues of different colors. If they have a different color, then you score the context-independent two-body energies. This would be the Leonard Jones energies, for instance. Um, and, uh, and you store those, um, those energies in the graph. And then if they're um, the same, then you can just reuse the stored energies that are already on that edge from the last time those pair, that pair was scored. Um, and, then, and then that's how you would, you would um, evaluate the energies for the, um, the short range pair energies in the graph. OK, and I think that's the last slide I have. How are these things colored? What is the color represented? Yeah, it's, um, it's whether or not two residues have, um, or let's see. So they have the same color if uh, you're traversing through the fold tree. And none of the degrees of freedom along that fold tree or the atom tree have changed since the last time scoring occurred. So every time you say set DOF um, to the confirmation, it marks a node in the fold tree, or in the atom tree, as you've changed since the last time we were scored. And then it, it figures out, um, so it traverses all the nodes in the, in the atom tree. And when it hits a section where, um, uh, so you have this this integer representing the current color. And you say, um, you know, residue 1 through 20, or let's say this is 1 and this is 20. Um, nothing has changed in here. And so that you sign same color, same color, same color, same color, same color, same color. And then you get to a node where you have a, um, an internal degree of freedom change. And you say, ah, I'm going to increment this color. So before it was 1, and now it's 2. And so you say, OK, well, there's a change in here. So I'm going to remember that this is now color 0, color 0 for your 3 more, 0, 0, 0. Right, it's internal degrees of freedom change there. And then, um, and then you start up here, and, and you're at, um, uh, I guess at this point, you're on residue 24. Um, and uh, sorry, it looks like this. Um, and, uh, and now you say, OK, this is color 2, color 2, color 2, color 2, and it goes all the way down. And so when you're figuring out whether residue um, 5 and rather residue fi uh, 35 are near each other, you ask, are, do they have the same color in the, in the full tree? I'm oh, sorry, did I say? Near each other. What I meant to say is, have they moved with respect to each other? Right. So, aren't there only two colors? So, moved or not moved? Well, in this case, um, but you could you could easily do something like um, add a fragment here and add a fragment um, there, right? In which case, you'd, you'd end up with something like that, and where you would have say three colors at that point. Because you'd be considering three residues. Um, let me draw that. So let's say um, I've got. Uh, this structure, right? And I'm going to do my fragment insertion um, at two positions. Let's say uh, uh, one and two. So I start off at the root of my full tree. I go there, and then I hit um, a stretch of color zero for that fragment that was inserted, right? And then I've incremented my color. So um, now it, uh, uh, it's going to take off in this direction. And then uh, um, and I've got another color zero for a while. Um, and then finally, uh, I've got my last section of the full tree. that will be color three. So that's, that's my new pose after two fragment insertions, given that I, I haven't rescored between them. Sorry, did I say? So any colors that are different from each other have to be rescored, like pairwise and things like that? Yeah. So you can reuse the interaction energies for regions that haven't moved with respect to each other. But you can't reuse them between regions that have moved with respect to each other. All right. Shall we take a 15-minute break? <laughs> well, that's just embarrassing. <laughs>